thank you very much for inviting me here and thank you for being here. I was overwhelmed when I saw so many of you outside. I wonder whether it was curiosity, whether it was the lecture or whether it is the topic itself. And I think it is the topic. Because when we talk about religious intolerance and how it's impacted democracy, nobody better than you would know it. For us, democracy and religion never went hand in hand. We had experienced this in Pakistan. We had experienced it in many other parts of the world where democracy was fragile, where there was a transition. But today we see that mature, established democracies are also falling apart and democratic values are being eroded because religious intolerance is being uh, opposed through religious intolerance. And one of the reasons that we decided to have this topic was because, first of all, for me at least, Amartya, Professor Amartya Sen, is not an Indian, he is not a Hindu, he is a global intellectual. And he has insistently written about how intolerance, how suppression of freedom can lead to, lead to poverty. He has made the connection between different freedoms. He has made the connection of how people can attain their aspirations, <coughs> not only through amassing wealth, but by being able to live a dignified life. And therefore I felt that this was a very apt topic for me to talk about, as it was a lecture in his name. He also wrote about how intolerance in one of his speeches, I'm sorry I left my three papers behind the first three pages, but so I can't quote him, we better. But he said in one of his speeches in India that we always had intolerance in India. But it is a question of tolerating intolerance. And that is, I think, the basic central point of my talk today. <coughs> intolerance, we all know, is infectious. And we are all worried about it today. We wonder why and how we have come to this point. I wonder that why we didn't worry that we wouldn't get to this point. Because if you really look at the big picture, you find out and you discover that Amartya was so right. When we first discovered, we all knew that Muslim women in Saudi Arabia could not even drive a car. We did not speak up as the Saudi wealth overpowered our conscience. And when we lost global conscience, when we lost global leadership, and when we lost values that were universal, we had to come to the stage where when we felt that it was the Afghans that were suffering and were being oppressed, we said we don't want to help them anymore as we had lit the inferno and then got the loot and therefore we had no interest left behind for the suffering of ones and the women and the minorities under the Taliban. We forgot that intolerance is a phenomenon that goes beyond borders. It was only after September 11 that the world woke up to the extreme tyranny being spread in the name of religion. And the lessons that we learned were simplistic, some misdirected, and others even dangerous that widened the scope of intolerant expression. For example, lesson one was let's have a regime change. So let's get rid of the Taliban and let's put in warlords and let's build democracy in Afghanistan. Now, I thought that that was a very simplistic way of dealing with a whole nation post-war, post-conflict and actually being disrespectful to their society 
by believing that that society did not have any aspirations within them. I very well recall that I was in Afghanistan soon after the war, and the UN was there to build so-called democracy, to build society there, having completely forgotten that the Afghans did have a culture, and the Afghans did have a language, and the Afghans did have a heart, and the Afghans did feel pain. And I asked one of the people who was at the head of the UN at that time and asked him, where are the political parties in Afghanistan? He said, we don't want political parties. It would be the NGOs that would build democracy in Afghanistan. So this is the manner in which we try to build societies. The second lesson that we learned was that paint all Muslims with one stroke of the brush. All Muslims are tyrannical, all Muslims are terrorists, all Muslims are extremists. And the third lesson that we learned was that we respond to brutality with intolerance and an equal measure of it. We did not learn the right lessons. We never went to the root of the problem. We did not realize that we never played with fire. Once you start politicizing religion and you, you play with fire, you get burnt as well. We did not learn that you do not support autocrats, whether they are through theocratic or secular. And we saw that the so-called international community did support a number of autocrats that were theocratic, a number of autocrats that were secular, and who were oppressing those <coughs> who took religion as part of politics. What happened was that the secular autocrats shut down all expression, all association, and all assembly. But what they could not shut down was the mosques. So they became the center of politics. And when change came, <coughs> theocratic forces were more organized than those that did not believe in extremism. And you see, for example, Egypt is a prime example of it. What happened in Egypt shows you how we can sit back and tolerate oppression if it is done in the name of weeding away extreme religious lobbies. And we fail to understand that while every society has germs of intolerance, every society also has germs where people aspire for greater freedoms. Democracy cannot be transplanted in an awkward manner. It has to be supported, nurtured, not ordered around. And it grows, yes, with the help of others, yes, with the help of people within the society, but it cannot be transplanted and brought with preconceived notions. And the other lesson that we didn't learn was that Muslim world is not homogeneous. For example, Women in Saudi Arabia cannot ride cars. Women in Iran cannot ride scooters. Women in Iran cannot be judges. Women in Pakistan can be judges. Women in Pakistan cannot give evidence on financial matters. But women in Bangladesh can. So there is no homogeneity in the Muslim world either. And there are different sects, there are different thinking, there are intellectuals and there are people who are atheists who don't believe in any religion, who may be born Muslims. But what we saw at the end of September 11th was the beginning of what we are seeing now, was the beginning of what has happened and what has, what has culminated today. What has happened today is that religion and fear has been politicized to the extent that it plays from electoral politics into policies, into institutional discrimination. Guantanamo Bay was only the first of its kind. It was just a symbol, a symbol which showed you the decline of a democratic belief <coughs> and decline of those leadership and that leadership that professed to lead a free world. 
The response is, but that if an Iranian government forced women to wear the scarf, we will force women and girls going to school not to wear the scarf. And if you look at, for example, the double standards that were always there became more visible. And these double standards that became visible became a tool into the hands of those extremists <coughs> who said that there is nobody for freedom. That those who profess that there are freedoms in this world only want freedom for themselves and not freedoms from another, other fathers. And there are several examples that they can give us, as we all know, from the Patriot Act to the stop and search in this country, uh, to migration and the manner in which some of the migrants are treated in the West. So the argument was that there is no such thing as liberal secular ideas, which I believe is wrong. And what we have done is we have simply played into their hands. I give you one example that has hurt me always is, and I give that example here today because Aung San Suu Kyi is a person that I admire a lot and I think we owe her a lot as well. And she is also a co-laureate like Amartya Sen. But her unwillingness to protect the Rohingya Muslims shows to you how intolerance has seeped into politics. And the level in which it has seeped, it immobilizes politicians. It immobilizes even those politicians that have will, that have a good will towards the freedoms that you and I aspire for. If you look at the whole question of how we, it took a long time for the UN to even address the question of Israeli settlements in Palestine, which was such an obvious uh, violation of the self-determination of the Palestinian people. The obvious reason for destroying a two-nation or a two-state theory, but it took a long while. And if you look, for example, the secular India, and I must say that I have been a great admirer of India's secular politics and India's deep and, and I call it now aging democracy rather than an old democracy. And I do remember in 1985, I was in India on an Asia conference and I had to read a paper on discrimination against women in Pakistan in the criminal justice system. And there was a minister by the name of Alva, Margaret Alva, who was chairing that session. And she was horrified after I finished my paper and said, my God, this can never happen in India. And I said, Madam, what is happening in Pakistan is so infectious. It can happen anywhere. <laughs> and if I see her now, I will be able to give her several examples of how Indians and Indian politics has changed. And the reason for this is also large-scale impunity for those who commit crime and offenses in the name of religion. Whether it is political leadership or whether it is the leader of a terrorist group or whether it is individuals who have committed crime in the name of religion, they are called back on the table like the Taliban are to this day and everybody is willing to have a dialogue with them. But a man who has stolen 50,000 rupees from a house is never called back to the table and forgiven. And this is impunity has to be addressed at four levels. Not only at national levels, but also at international levels. Then we saw that this is, there has been polarization. This kind of double standards, this kind of hatred versus hatred has polarized society to a point that in the past we saw that in the movement, the Taliban movement or the Jihadi movement before that, or the Al-Qaeda movement, women were not participants of terrorist groups. But now we are seeing that even women are becoming participants <coughs> in groups that want to foist their values on us to the barrel of a gun. And who is 
challenging them in a more effective way, I think there is a void in our society. I do not see any policy, global or otherwise, leadership that is challenging the narrative, that is challenging them in terms of reaching out to the people, in terms of education to the young people, looking at the root causes, because wherever I go to a conference, I'm told poverty is the root cause of all this. Well, if poverty was the root cause of all this, then the millions of poor people in this country would not let us be alive today. We, when we are talking about poverty, they exploit poverty. And what we are talking about is, if poverty is the root cause of it, then eradicate poverty. Let's fight with poverty. Let's not fight with the poor who have been exploited. And I say this to you because I have done several cases in Pakistan where young people have been exploited to the extent that they did not even know where they were going. They were picked up, they were taken, they were armed, and they were forced into accepting money for their families that were dying of hunger or virtual hunger. And they came into a life of their own without even realizing that they had gone so deep into crime. And I wonder who is to blame for this. And if there is no common action in the world. If young girls are picked up in Nigeria by Boko Haram, they're not Nigerian children. They're my child, they're your child. And we don't see that common action at all. We also see that religion is being manipulated as, an, as a tool, and it has become a tool in the hands of unscrupulous politicians, where they will use religion to get to power, either to, against religious intolerance, or by pretending that they are not religiously intolerant, but that they are simply <coughs> protecting their own religion. We have examples of people who have used to get into power. It's like a ladder that they go up that ladder of democracy. And once they reach the top, they just throw away the ladder. And then they come into their own and use religion for persecution purposes. There are other who have used it as an instrument of fear. And we see that spaces for three expressions have shrunk even in mature democracies. Free expression in the sense that there can be no discourse on religion. And every time you have a discussion on religion, you are told that it's racism. Well, there is a difference between racism and religion. You cannot change your race, but you can change your religion. And religion is a set of ideas which needs to be discussed. And you cannot asphyxiate debate on religion. Whereas you don't discuss race because it happens to be there. You cannot change it. That's your expression. And so this kind of a thoughtlessness has left a vacuum in the political development in the, not just my country or your country, but in the world. We have seen, for example, many examples where religious intolerance not only affects democracy, but also affects economic growth. If you look at the example of Nigeria, there are certain states in Nigeria that apply religious laws, and there are others that don't apply religious laws. And if you visit Nigeria, you go to these states which are called the Sharia state, you see a decline even in economic wealth. And there is oppression, while in the non-Sharia state, wealth or economic well-being is better. You see, for example, in India, uh, some states have anti-conversion laws, others don't. And the ones that do have anti-conversion laws, there is more political religious conflict in those, very, in those very states. We see in Pakistan, for example, in 1986, 
we had the blasphemy law. Before 1986, we had two cases of blasphemy. And now we have thousands of cases of blasphemy. Now, that just goes to show that the law itself, when it comes to religion, you have to be very careful on legislating because the law itself can become an instrument of persecution. And so I, I think that if you look at many other examples of how the leadership of the so-called free world <coughs> has in a way betrayed us by, by challenging religious intolerance in, in ways that are undemocratic and, and are not compatible with human rights. In my own country, disappearances started after September 11th. There may have been a few disappearances earlier, but it was not a pattern. And what had happened was that the US wanted religious extremists to be handed to them, so people were picked up and they were given to the CIA to be taken away to Guantanamo Bay or to be taken away to Afghanistan. Well, our intelligence agencies felt that if the leader of the free world wants us to disappear people, why can't we help ourselves? So once they had done it for their masters, they decided to disappear people from Balochistan. And this is how disappearances to this day occur in Pakistan. And if you look, for example, at the whole question and the whole debate about not only disappearances, and I'm not certainly saying, let me first make that absolutely clear, I am not putting the blame on the free world. I am putting the blame on myself. I am putting the blame on those societies which let religious intolerance breed, breed, and prosper in their societies. But equally I am saying that those that did not believe in religious intolerance did not act with wisdom, did not act with care, did not act with a consistent policy when, when they were challenged as well. And that is why we have a polarized world today, a world where freedom of expression, but in particular, freedom of association and freedom of assembly has become very difficult, not only in countries like myself, but also in mature democracies, as I said earlier. India is one example. The US is another example. In my own country, of course, we cannot meet. Many of the non-governmental NGOs have been stopped from working because they criticize what is called CPAC, which is an economic corridor that China is helping us to build. CPEC has become a kind of a national anthem in Pakistan. You can't speak against CPEC. If you do so, then you can be arrested, you can be harassed. But ours is, a, is an old story. Now, what about the new stories that are emerging in the world? And the new di dynamics that is erupting is a dynamics that we are faced with not just religious intolerance, but we are faced with a world which has become insecure and uncertain. The alliances that are taking place, even in the name of development, do not respect what we call political freedoms. And we are time and again sort of preach that political freedoms do not come before economic freedom. Economic rights, I believe, go hand in hand with political rights. And one of the reasons I always argue for it is <laughs> that as far as political rights are concerned, you can ask governments, please don't torture. Doesn't cost them anything not to torture. <coughs> please don't arrest people arbitrarily. Doesn't cost them anything to do that. It's a frame of mind. But if you ask people, the, the governments to have development in education, in health, they may have an answer for you, which I don't buy, but they may have an answer for you, that they don't have enough resources. But resources is not an issue when you're asking people to respect the dignity of its fellow citizens and people who live within their jurisdictions or people who travel within their jurisdictions. Now, if you look at not only Pakistan, but I read, for example, 
what has happened in Europe, a report that throwing a pork head or a grenade on mosques, assaulting Muslim women with headscarves, demonstrating against superstores, selling halal, are happening on a daily basis in the 21st century Europe. But this, by all means, does not mean that you absolve those who recruit children in the name of religion, kill, and participate in conflicts. If you look, for example, my own country, I used to say it's one of the worst as far as human rights records are concerned, and particularly religious rights. Not anymore. I say it's many of them. One, not one of the worst, but it's amongst many who are now the worst. We have also to face up to new challenges. The new challenges that disturb us are the ownership that religious intolerance, forces of religious intolerance are taking over. The ownership in digitalization, social media, and that is where the opportunities that liberal politics have, they are not being captured enough. So we have information, a lot of information, a lot of disinformation, attacks and threats, but we have not built on the opportunities for building greater partnerships across the globe to resist the turnaround of values, to protect the universality of basic values. That are the only sustainable ingredients of a democratic system. And as Amartya Sen, Professor Amartya Sen rightly said, we have to understand the remarkable empirical connection that links freedom of different kinds with one another. Political freedom in the form of free speech and elections help to promote economic security. Social opportunities in the form of education and health facilitate economic participation. Economic facilities in the form of opportunities for participation in trade and production can help to generate personal abundance as well as public resources for social facilities. Freedom of different kinds can strengthen one another. It helps creators and create it helps the creators and creativity is built and thus technological technological advance and information on science can be on our side if we look at the whole phenomena of all the rights together rather than each one separately. But at the end I would like to add that you can preach religious tolerance. At the end of it, there are two necessary ingredients. First is a public opinion that you will have to build. And a public opinion that does not say that there are double standards, but a public opinion that says, I will not tolerate intolerance. And secondly, we have to rethink the way our democracies work. Because democracies must be a platform, a springboard for people with ideas, with people who have certain aspirations, people who feel, who have a common conscience with its electorate to really take on the leadership. But it has now become a springboard for opportunists. It has become a springboard for those who want to even make themselves rich. It has become a springboard for leadership that just wishes to have some kind of control over people in the name of democracy. And unless and until we don't challenge not only democratic values that are being undermined, but also the kind of leadership that the new or the old democratic system is producing, we will be failing and we will be failing not even in our endeavor, but we will be living in a world that will be more and more oppressive. So thank you very much.
कीप वॉचिंग टीवी सेवन एट सिक्स देखते रहिए